All right, well, let's take our Bibles and look in Daniel chapter 9. And my text is from verse 20 down to verse 27. And I've entitled this 70 Weeks Purposed and Fulfilled. There's some, when they read this portion, they've got this all divided up. They say, well, we're already past the 69 weeks, but there's that one week left. And uh, they call that the week of the tribulation period, when Antichrist will come. Somehow they've taken and divided up what was, is pretty clear if you just read it for what it is. <laughs> And they've turned it into a whole message of speculation and what I call false prophecy. And so I want us to look at this carefully here because what the Lord was showing to Daniel perplexed him. And yet the Lord is very clear when he reveals the answer to questions. And so here in Daniel chapter 9, beginning with verse 20, it says, and whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, speaking of their Jerusalem, yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in a vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me, about the time of the evening oblation. And we know that the temple was destroyed and there was no more sacrifice being offered there in Jerusalem. And yet it was during this time that Daniel set aside for prayer during the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee. That shows us right here that when the Lord causes one of us to cry unto him in prayer, that the answer is already sure and certain. That's what he's talking about. At the beginning of thy supplication, the commandment came forth. Well, who gave the commandment? That was God. To go speak to Daniel, I'm come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Now, if we don't get anything else out of this portion of Scripture, verse 24 is like the preface to a book or the summary of what you're about to read. And here he says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. That means that from the time this 70 weeks time begins, these prophetic weeks to the end, all of this is to take place. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. So already we know when this time period would begin. When the Lord raised up Cyrus to make that decree that the people should go back and rebuild Jerusalem. And unto the Messiah, the prince, this is going forward during all this time to Messiah. We know who that is. That's Christ. The prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. You say, well, why did he divide up seven weeks and then three score and two? That would be a total of 69 weeks. Three score and two is 62 plus seven. Well, it's because those first seven weeks and that word weeks there is actually sevens. Seven sevens is the way it's put. And this time was counted as Sabbaths, the years of Jubilee, every seven years that you would have 
when everything went back to its original owner. The seven weeks that are mentioned here, that was exactly the time, the first 49 years when the temple was rebuilt and the city rebuilt. So that's that first seven weeks and then continuing forward from there, three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks, so here you've got the 69 weeks and this is where people put a parenthesis, but there's no parentheses here. When it says after three score and two weeks, those 69 years after the first seven years, Messiah shall be cut off. That tells you something right there about this time period. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and under the end of the war, desolations are determined. Well, the people of the prince, we know from reading in Matthew chapter 22 that that had to do with the Romans. That when the in, in the in the week, so that, that means that that 70th week would already have been instituted, that the Messiah would be cut off, and in the end, the people of the prince, we find that out to be the Romans, shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's talking about 70 AD right there. In the end thereof shall be with a flood, and under the end of the war, desolations are determined. We're going to look a little bit more at that next time. But here's the point where some get off track because in verse 27 it says, He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. So a lot of people say, Well, the He there, they refer that to the Antichrist, some future time when the Antichrist is going to come and confirm a covenant with many for one week. But you can't take things out of context. He here refers back to the Messiah. And when you compare this with what our Lord Jesus Christ said, even on the eve of his going to the cross, when he said, this is the New Testament in my blood, which was shed for many, is shed for many. That's how he confirmed the covenant with many, the many, for one week during that particular time. And notice, in the midst of the week. So we're not talking about any parenthesis here where there's, a, there's another week remaining that we're to look forward to. In the midst of that 70th week, that time period that was allotted, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. It's not talking about some antichrist. It's talking about Christ who caused the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Why? By his death. There remains no more sacrifice for sin because Christ in his death fulfilled everything that was foretold by those sacrifices and oblations. But then... It looks forward, it says, for the overspreading of abomination. He shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. When our Lord was going to the cross, he told those women that were weeping, don't weep for me, but weep rather for yourselves, for your house is left to you desolate. So all the while they were crucifying our Lord Jesus Christ and by him the sacrifice and oblation would cease. There would, there would be, was to be no more sacrifice, animal sacrifices being offered. Yet the same Lord Jesus Christ who laid down his life, not as a victim, but as the, the victorious savior at the same time would ordain that there would be the overspreading of abomination, even when Christ died and rose again and sent on high, where he ever rules and reigns from glory. As we're going to see in the chapters of Matthew 24 and 26, our Lord returned in judgment, he didn't return to this earth, but he returned in power 
clouds of glory, in, from clouds of glory in his seat in glory, he brought an end, that's what it's talking about, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. We're going to look at that some more next time. So we know here the setting of this prophecy and uh, that Daniel, as we saw already, had learned through Jeremiah that the period that God had set for the desolations of Jerusalem was just 70 years. And as Daniel was praying, we saw, we saw that in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 1, the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books, and we saw that wasn't just Jeremiah, but that was Isaiah, the number of the years, whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Isn't it interesting how we see this word 70 being used here? That there would be, that would be the length of time that, that Israel at that time would be under the bondage of Nebuchadnezzar. And if you go back to Jeremiah, I think we touched on this last time, but review is always good. In Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse 11, this is what Daniel would have been reading. In Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse 11, it says, this whole land shall be a desolation and astonishment, and those these nations shall serve the king of Babylon. How many years? 70 years. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity in the land of the Chaldeans and will make it perpetual desolation. And I will bring upon the land all my words, which I have pronounced against it, even all that is written in this book, which Jeremiah hath prophesied against all the nation. That's what Daniel was reading. And so he could see, because Daniel was there at the beginning, and he'd been in this captivity for this period of time, but he was seeing that this period of time was about to expire and that there would be a decree whereby that captivity would be ended and the Jews would be allowed and even exhorted by a, a wicked king of the Medes and the Persians that would take over the land and, and the city within two years. And we see that if you look back in Ezra chapter one, even though these are separated in our Bible, yet in time, we see a lot of parallels. Ezra chapter one and verse one. This is the time period here now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia. And notice that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing saying, thus saith, Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. So this is what the context is here and, and the effect on Daniel on receiving that revelation is what brought him to his knees. Here in Daniel chapter nine, verse 20, while he was yet speaking and praying, in considering all of these things that God brought the response to Daniel's prayer in the form of this revelation that we find here. And again, by Gabriel, the angel. And that the 70 years of captivity were to be followed by a period of 77s of years. <laughs> so you see the connection with the word 70. And as I said, the word rendered here weeks, where he says in verse 24, 70 weeks. That word really is the word sevens. So there's no doubt when you read this that that period designated in this prophecy 
would be 77s of years. And that's where you get 490 years. And you can go right down to the time of Christ and his coming and appearing and go back 490 years chronologically and it'll fit exactly that time period from the time that Cyrus put forth a decree that Jerusalem should be rebuilt and that this would be carried forward unto, as it says there in verse 25, unto Messiah the Prince. So we're not looking at something yet to be fulfilled in one of these weeks. That's why the title of this message is 70 Weeks Purposed and Fulfilled. And just like there was a termination of the 70 years of captivity, according to God's purpose and decree, so there would be a conclusion, a termination for the people of Israel. They would not always continue, especially when you read here that in God's purpose, that when these 490 years were fulfilled, that physical Jerusalem, as it had been known to that point, would no longer be. God would destroy it. And as we look back even now, some 2,000 years since this time, when Rome destroyed that temple, it's never been rebuilt. And I will tell you, it never will be, according to what we read in Scripture. The Lord, when he purposed to make it desolate, he made it desolate. It says, until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So we find the scriptures are very precise and therefore we want to read it with preciseness as well. But as we consider these main parts here of this particular revelation to Daniel, Two things are certain. One is the coming at the end of this time and the cutting off of the Messiah. When was the Messiah cut off? Well, at the cross. So this is describing what should take place from that decree to go back and build Jerusalem again to the time in which the Messiah would come. But secondly, what's clear is that there would be a destruction and desolation of the city and the sanctuary because that's what we read up there with regard to these 70 weeks in verse 24. It says, are determined upon the people and upon the holy city. A lot of people like to say that, well, God still has a plan for Israel. and They're still his favorite people. Favored sons, well, I beg to differ. There is such a destruction and a consummation of destruction that has come upon Israel that when Christ came and finished his work, there was no more reason for God to even preserve that nation. Now, I, I know you can say, well, Israel's still there. Yes, that's God's faithfulness. He said it would be. But as far as God's blessing, there's a new Jerusalem. There's a new Israel that has come forth from this Messiah when he was cut off. And that's the very people of, of Christ. He's called Messiah the Prince because that's who he is. He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I find it interesting that the same Gabriel at the beginning of this particular prophecy, the Lord used to speak to Daniel and to reveal unto him and to say unto him, thou art greatly beloved. And when you compare what the same Gabriel said to Mary in Luke chapter one, we won't turn over there right now, but in Luke chapter 1, verses 11 through 19, then verse 26, the same Gabriel that brought the predictions to Daniel is the same one that announced the approaching of the fulfillment of what was declared those 490 years previous. 
Same Gabriel. Time is of no consequence to the Lord. But I'll tell you, when it's time, it's time. And everything goes on his clock. And so here in this particular revelation that the Lord gave to Daniel, we have really seven points that are the main elements for a right understanding of it. And I'll just touch on these here in this message. And then Lord willing, we'll come back to it again the next time. So even as we got 77s, we've got seven aspects also of this particular revelation that we find here. And they're laid out pretty plainly there in verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. One, to finish the transgression. Two, to make an end of sins. Three, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Five, to seal up the vision and prophecy. And six, to anoint the most holy. And you say, well, where's your seventh? Well, the seventh has to do with the desolation that would come at the end of all this. Once God had fulfilled his purpose with regard to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his death on the cross of resurrection ascension and ascension into glory, then what remained of this particular prophecy here would be the utter desolation and destruction not to be rebuilt. See, that's the difference because the 70 years that Israel was in captivity, God brought them back again. The temple was rebuilt. It's because none of this yet had been accomplished. But once the Messiah was come, and everything accomplished according to God's purpose, then there was no more purpose for that city or that sanctuary. And God brought great destruction upon it. Now, if the Lord has been pleased to teach us by his spirit, these six items that we see here or parts of this revelation, it's pretty clear of whom it speaks, isn't it? Let me ask you, when Christ came, it was to finish the transgression, wasn't it? And to make an end of sins, not of the world, but of his people. Did he not come to make reconciliation for iniquity? So again, here we see that this particular revelation concerning these seven the weeks and what was to be the culmination of it would be with this, with Christ's work, to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy. What's that talk about? Well, Christ said, it's finished. Seal up the vision and prophecy. Everything that had prophesied, been prophesied concerning him in the Old Testament. And to anoint the most holy, anoint him. That's how he's the anointed one that in all of this he would be anointed of his father. And so as we consider the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, he didn't come to attempt to save. He came to save. He didn't come to try to get people to turn to him. No, he came to satisfy his father on behalf of that people that the father had given him. And the question is, did he do it? And the answer is very plainly. That's what we read here concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, that he would come and finish the transgression. Now some, when they see that first part to finish the transgression, some say that this is spoken by way of condemnation even upon Israel that even though to this point God had been forbearing with them as a nation, yet there would, would come a, a time when the Lord would finish that transgression. And they refer to some portions of scripture in the New Testament where, for example, look over in Matthew chapter 23. Here we're tying together some of what 
our Lord was saying when, when he came. But in Matthew 23, verse 31, he says, Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. That's a way of speaking there of fill ye up the measure of your fathers. A way of, of declaring that there would be an end to God's patience and forbearance with this nation. And that he would ultimately finish the transgression in their condemnation. Now we know in salvation, he finished the transgression of his people by his death, and his blood shed. But with regard to the people of Israel, that fullness, that filling up of that measure of transgression against that people, God brought to pass in their ultimate dis destruction. In fact, the Lord said that all of these things would come to pass in that particular generation. And then when you get over to Matthew 24 specifically, you read there, a lot of people think, well, Matthew 24, that's still talking about the future coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Lord from the beginning there in verse one said, Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. <laughs> but according to what Daniel had already written, that temple was purpose for destruction. There would be a, a filling up, if you will, a finishing up the trend of the transgression pertaining to that particular temple and that people. And uh, that's why the Lord said, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And we're going to look at that next time. That's part of the, the remaining part of this <clears throat> revelation is prophecy. But the part that I want us to see here is the part that Christ came to fulfill in these particular points that we see here. Coming back to my text in Daniel 9 and verse 24, that when Christ went to the cross, he made an end of transgression. He, he, he finished the transgression according to God's purpose, that he went to that cross as the sin bearer. And from the cross, that's why he cried, it is finished. So we see that in that first description, but then secondly, in line with that, to make an end of sins. We could spend an entire message just on this. Did Christ put away sin or didn't he? Was his death simply an offer, a potential, like you hear preachers say today, that he died in order to save you, but you have to believe on him in order to make that effectual? No. Here, Specifically, it says to make an end of sins. There's still sin in the world, so it's clear that he didn't die to save the world, but he made an end of sins on behalf of that people that the Father gave him. If you look over in Hebrews chapter 10, and verse 12, there's so many scriptures we could consider, but I believe you see it here very simply. And this is why I said this revelation is clear. Let's not muddy it. This 490 years was to be culminated in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, where it says there that in the midst of the week, that 70th week, and if you want to consider that three, some say that when they count back, the, the, the week began with his public baptism, when he was officially presented to people publicly three weeks or three and a half years later is when he was crucified and then three and a half years after that was when in the book of Acts the apostle Paul was preaching and he shook the dust off his feet and told the Jews that you consider yourselves to be unworthy of the kingdom we turn to the Gentile nations and that would have been the official end of God's dealings with that nation in any way, even though it would be another 
generation later before Jerusalem was destroyed, but already God had given them over to their own destruction. But as far as making an end of sins for his people, we see this here in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 12. Notice, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. One sacrifice. And back in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14, it says, and much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. In other words, all those for whom Christ paid the debt, their sin has been put away. When was it put away? It was put away in his death. It's not put away when you believe. If the Lord gives you his spirit to believe on Christ, it's because your sins were already put away and that Christ had already made an end of those sins in his death. And then thirdly, to make reconciliation for iniquity. That's the true work of Christ. Everything up to there was a covering, an atonement in God's forbearance. But when were the sins of all of God's people put away? When were they justified before God? People want to argue about that. Well, it's pretty clear to make reconciliation for iniquity. Iniquity. If they had already been reconciled in eternity, as some say, well, as soon as God thought it, then it was done, they were justified, what would be the purpose for making reconciliation? The purpose is that that sin was there under the law until such time as Christ put it away. And to make reconciliation means that even the elect of God were considered to be at enmity with God until Christ had paid the debt. You find that over in Romans chapter 5, in verses 8 through 10. Scriptures are clear. When people want to use logic to try to reason and argue, and that's what they do. They say, well, if God purposed it from eternity, that means they were justified. That's not what the scriptures say. What was purposed was the guarantee assurance that it would come to pass. But here in Romans chapter 5, it says, but God commend his love toward us and that while we were yet, what? Sinners, Christ died for us. It doesn't say while we were already justified, Christ died. No, while we were yet sinners. Much more than being now justified. And now's the time word. By his blood. There was no blood to shed in eternity. There was no body in eternity. A body has thou prepared for me. It was necessary that according to God's decree and purpose, these things be worked out in a timely manner, just like we're reading here with these 70 weeks. Determined. All of it. We shall be saved from wrath through him. So to make reconciliation for the iniquity, that, that was accomplished in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what? To bring in an everlasting righteousness. That's the fourth thing. When was righteousness established? That word righteousness means justify, justice. When was it brought in? It was brought in when Christ died. He was delivered up. Paul wrote to the Romans for our iniquities. And he was raised for or because of our justification. That's when it was brought in. That's when it was established. Christ earned and established that righteousness. And God, upon completion of Christ's death, once for all declared righteous everyone for whom he paid the debt. And then, as I mentioned already, to seal up the vision and the prophecy. That's talking about all the Old Testament scriptures. There's no new revelation being given. Everything that was written in that Old Testament was sealed up, closed up. Nothing more to be accomplished or fulfilled because that's what all scripture is about. It's looking forward to him. And then ultimately to anoint the most holy. That's how the Paul wrote to the Romans there concerning Christ and his work. He's, the, the, the word Christ means the anointed one. And, to, and that he be clearly manifest as being that one. But Paul says that the gospel that he was separated unto, the gospel of God, Romans chapter one, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, 
which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared, there's the anointing, declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness, the Holy Spirit, by the resurrection from the dead. So all of this, and we'll come back to it, but all of this was what brought peace and comfort to Dan. As yes, he was troubled by what yet lay ahead with regard to the Jewish people and their end, but at the same time, to see how those that were the Lord's, the Lord Jesus Christ himself would finish the work and complete it to the honor and glory of God the Father.